As for the third question, this is where I'd like to uh, devote the bulk of my time, uh, because here is where Muslims and Christians are divided. Uh, our Christian friends say that Jesus was fully God, and uh, Muslims uh, would insist that uh, there is only one God, uh, the one whom Jesus actually worshipped. So I would appeal to our Christian friends tonight to look carefully at the Bible and to realize that the Bible does not actually justify the claim that Jesus is God in the sense of the Almighty God. God. Let me differentiate between a few positions uh, so that we can get more into the uh, heat of this discussion. Um, think about our Jehovah's Witnesses friends. They believe that Jesus was a sort of God, a God, but not the Almighty God. So they would look at John chapter 1 verse number 1 where it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And they would translate it and the Word was a God. And they have uh, a sort of grammatical justification for that uh, translation. Whether that is justified or not, uh, it's not my, uh, my, my stopping point at the moment. My point is simply that here is a Christian belief that Jesus is a sort of God, but not the Almighty God. We need to recognize that when we speak about the Almighty God, we are speaking about that incomparable being. He beyond, with nothing, beyond which nothing greater can be conceived. Now, if, if there is someone who is lesser uh, than him, or if he is greater than someone else, then that someone else obviously is not God. And we have in John chapter 14, verse number 28, that Jesus himself says, my father is greater than I. So when he is referring to God as someone greater than himself, he being the lesser, obviously is not that beyond which nothing greater can be conceived, and therefore he is not the almighty God, regardless whatever else we might say about him. Now, uh, the, the Aryan controversy in the 4th uh, century was precisely about this point. Is Jesus uh, a sort of God, a sort of divine being, but not the Almighty God, or is he, as he would be declared in the Council of Nicaea, uh, very God of very God? So we have two sides of this, and Jehovah's Witnesses have picked up again on that uh, Aryan uh, formula of saying that Jesus was a sort of divine being, but not the Almighty God. Now, if we say that Jesus was uh, the Almighty God, we, we run into some difficulties of uh, trying to reconcile that uh, with the, the obvious declaration throughout the Bible that there is only one God. Now, we have to find a way to conceive of Jesus and the Father as being together as only one God, while Jesus is God and the Father is God at the same time. Now, the oneness Pentecostalists uh, have their own way of working this out. To them, uh, the Father came down here on the earth, so it, it is the same one person that one individual who you might refer to as Father and as Son, and, and also as Holy Spirit in various modes of his uh, existence or appearance. Now this goes back to a very ancient uh, creed as well, uh, that uh, was uh, known to be that of a person named Sabellius, and so the creed is called Sabellianism, uh, the belief uh, that God goes through different modes of existence, and it is also called modalism for the very same uh, reason. Trinitarian Christians reject that. Tr the Trinity holds that there are three uh, eternal persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the three are one. So there is one God substance, uh, Christian theologians have decided to say, uh, but there are three persons that share that one God substance. So there are not three gods, there are three persons. The Father is a person, the Holy Spirit is a person, the Son is a person. Uh, each is a person, and each one of these persons is God, and yet there is only one God, because the Christian theologians assure us there is only one God substance. But now, to maintain uh, the, the belief that there is on, this only one God substance and the three persons who each is to be called God, uh, this is very difficult in, in practice. And one f tends to fall uh, into heresy uh, in, in one way or another in trying to maintain this uh, uh, belief. Uh, and so, let me show you a couple of books.
We have a book entitled uh, The Trinity and subtitled How Not to Be a Heretic by Stephen uh, Bolivant. Uh, what, <laughs> it, it's, uh, I mean, the, the, the title is very telling, it's a subtitle in fact. Uh, Stephen Bolivant wrote this book to, to help Christians to speak of the Trinity in the right way. Uh, because if you don't speak about it precisely in the right way, you fall, it's like walking a tight rope. You either fall into heresy on this side or on the other side. What happens is that if you emphasize uh, the distinctiveness of the three persons too much, then you make them into three gods. You fall into the heresy of tritheism. And if you de-emphasize the distinctiveness of the three persons, then in the end it seems like you only have one person and you have fallen back into Sabellianism or modalism and it, as, as is now represented in the oneness Pentecostalist uh, uh, church. Another book uh, along the same lines is uh, The Forgotten Trinity by my good friend uh, James R. White. Now James uh, White speaks about uh, the, the heresy that uh, the, the average well-meaning Christian may fall into. Like for example, when, when somebody speaks as though uh, God goes through uh, three different appearances as someone might do in a play, putting on one mask to represent one role as they did in ancient times and then putting on another mask to represent a different role, uh, the same actor but three different uh, appearances. Uh, now uh, obviously what uh, James wants to, to assure us about is that in the Trinity there are actually three actors, but of course there are three actors who share the one God substance. There are three uh, persons. And to emphasize it further, uh, James is uh, telling us that the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father. Neither are any of these the Holy Spirit. Each one is distinct by him himself. Uh, often, in a gathering like this, uh, I have found that a Christian would stand up to ask a question and uh, if they actually want to convince me that uh, the, the, there is a logic behind the Trinity. And they would say, well, you know, it's like me. I am a, I am a father. I'm also a son. I'm also a husband. So here I have three different roles. Well, putting it that way is falling back into Sabellianism and to modalism because that's the one person in three different social roles. That's like Jesus himself having different social roles. He is a friend, he's a brother, he's the son of his mother. So he has different social roles, but he's one person. Uh, but that's not the Trinity. Uh, the classical definition of the Trinity says uh, not that there are three social roles, but that there are three persons, each of whom might have uh, different social and, uh, and economic functions. So one falls into these heresies one uh, way or, or, or another. Uh, another problem was pointed out by Peter of uh, Callinicum um, in, in, in the 5th century, who wrote a book about this, and the book has recently been uh, republished uh, for our education. Uh, he charged that uh, Christians are falling into um, another sort of heresy, which uh, involves a fourth God. Now if you think about it, you have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit, and each one by themselves as God. What about the combination, the three of them together? Now, uh, if we think of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, each is powerful by himself or herself, but when they work together as a team, the team is obviously more powerful uh, than, than the individuals uh, by themselves. So, uh, Peter of Kalinicum is asking, when Christians think about the, the Godhead, and then the three persons that share the Godhead, isn't the Godhead greater than, than any one of the persons by themselves? And do you not, in fact, end up thinking of really four entities, the three persons plus the Godhead. Uh, so it, 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 this is a difficult concept, the Trinity. But uh, I, I want to appeal to our Christian friends and say that if you, if you go back to the Bible itself, you will realize that the Bible does not actually support the belief in the Trinity. Uh, the Bible actually supports more Arianism as it is, as the Bible is now. In that you will find passages which depict Jesus as Son of God, uh, as the Word of God, uh, as a being between God and man, uh, through whom God created created the universe, uh, but not as the Almighty God himself. 
It, it, and the very statement, uh, the, the, the intermediary being through whom God created the universe, we're talking about God as being someone else other than Jesus, who is shown to be this intermediary being. Now, not all of the documents of the New Testament present Jesus in the same way. Uh, the earliest of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Mark, shows Jesus to have many uh, important limitations. Limitations in his knowledge, limitations in his power. And uh, when people responded to him, they obviously did not take him to, to be the Almighty God. But we will see in, in later documents, later Gospels, uh, Matthew and Luke, for example, and especially the Gospel according to John, uh, we see a much more developed theology in which Jesus is represented as that intermediary being. So we have, for example, in John's Gospel, for the first time among the Gospels, uh, the mention of Jesus as the Word of God, through whom God made everything else. Uh, this concept was not there in the previous Gospels. The title, the Word of God is only in the gospel according to John. So how did that happen? Imagine Jesus on the scene and Jesus was uh, teaching people uh, about himself. Well, naturally he would tell them, I am the word of God, if he was the word of God. And, and that would be one of the most important statements Jesus would have, been, would have made ever. And all of the writers would want to write the same thing. But that is not what uh, the, the other three gospel writers wrote. It is only John who picked this up. And John is said to be written late in the first uh, century century. And uh, as Dr. James White uh, points out, well, John would have had a long time to reflect not only on what Jesus said, but on what he meant. And many uh, writers uh, excuse the gospel according to John uh, on this basis, that because it was written late, it came after a long period of reflection. But I would say a long period of development um, in the f if centuries after Jesus uh, had been taken away from the scene. Uh, Christians continued to think about Jesus, preach about him, and uh, to develop develop a theology about him away from what Jesus actually taught. But that is not so much my point. My point is still that even if you take the, the documents as they are, even John with his full development as it is, John does not present Jesus as being the Almighty God. Uh, John for, uh, chapter 17 verse number 3 has Jesus looking up into heaven and praying and saying this is eternal life that they may know you as the only true God and Jesus your messenger as Christ. Uh, in, in fact, apart from uh, referring to Jesus as Father, th th this is a, a very um, uh, Muslim thing to say. Uh, the one Jesus was speaking to is the only true God, and Jesus is to be recognized as God's Christ, or Messiah, or in the Arabic, Al-Masih, as is mentioned in the Quran in chapter 3, verse number 42, and in many other passages uh, of, of the Quran. Uh, we go to Paul's writings, and people refer to the Carmen Christi in, in Philippians chapter 2 to say that Paul uh, took Jesus to be God. But what Paul is saying there has to be bracketed within the rest of the Pauline writings, uh, and even in Philippians itself. Now normally, Paul uh, begins his letters with doxologies, in which he is praising God, who he says is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a God who is the Father, and yes, there is our Lord Jesus Christ, but he is not the one who Paul is calling God. Even in Philippians, if we're looking at chapter 2 and you want to interpret it uh, in that way, look at the problems you encounter. Philippians uh, chapter 1 starts with the same doxology, giving glory to God the Father and distinguishing God the Father from Jesus Christ, who is not called God. And uh, in, in uh, the, the same book of Philippians ends in the same way, with, uh, with Paul distinguishing between God the Father and Jesus Christ. What is more important is that uh, in, if that was Philippians chapter 2, in which we have the Carmen Christi, in chapter 3, uh, Paul declares that we worship God the Father. So it's clear whom he worships. So Philippians chapter 2 cannot be understood to mean that Paul is calling on Christians to worship Jesus. No. In fact, what he's saying basically is that Jesus was in the form of God. And what that means needs to be unpacked. Because God, in fact, does not have any form. He's not saying that Jesus was God. But he was uh, something maybe of a, in, in some kind of a divine form. That's the best way of explaining what Paul was saying. Jesus then, instead of trying to go higher 
than he already was, he chose to come lower as a man, and then lower still by, by allowing himself to be crucified, and then as a result of him coming lower, God lifted him up higher and granted him a name that, that is greater than he had before. It's a lesson in humility. If you come down from the position that you already have, God will lift you up to a higher position than you already have. So for him to be lifted up to a higher position than he already had, that means that he was not God to begin with. And then, of course, he does not ever become God because Paul begins and ends the same letter uh, with the same doxology. And he confesses in the next chapter that he only worships God. And, and God the Father is what he is referring to there. So what does it mean that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow? Well, let me uh, add a point here from Muslim practice. There are verses of the Quran which, when we recite them or hear them, uh, we fall on our knees, we, we fall prostrate, but we are praising God. So we fall prostrate to the glory of God. We don't worship the verses, but the verses remind us of God, and we prostrate. So Paul seems to be saying something similar. At the mention of Jesus' name, uh, Christians will fall on their knees, they will, uh, to the glory of God. But that does not mean that Jesus is being regarded as God. A similar expression is found in Philippians chapter 1, where the glory of God is to be given by Christians through Christ. It's not that Christ himself is the end point and, and that Christ himself is the God. I believe I'm getting close to, to my time here. How much time do I have? <laughs> One minute. I, I'm almost sorry that I asked. You know, she might have fallen asleep. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. But uh, uh, to be fair, let me wrap it up then and say uh, that in short, there has been a development where Jesus has, through the centuries, even through the Gospels we can see, has been made uh, from a man into a divine being, a, 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 an intermediary between man and God through whom God created the entire universe. But still, uh, he has not been made into God in the Gospels or in the Pauline writings or anywhere in the New Testament. The New Testament continues to affirm that there is only one God and he's not Jesus. Now, if our Christian friends can come to this belief that there is only one God who is not Jesus, but the one who you refer to as the Father of your Lord Jesus Christ, that will bring Christians and Muslims close together in harmony and we can work better together uh, to achieve greater things uh, for the world. If one refuses to come to that position, one walks on the tightrope of the Trinity with the possibility of always falling into heresy on this side of the rope or on the other side. Thank you very much. Another quick question for Andy. There's actually a couple of uh, that have come in okay. in this vein. Yeah. Uh, how do you define the Trinity in contrast to what Dr. Ali spoke about tonight? Or another question phrased it similarly. How could we speak of the Trinity or how would you speak of the Trinity uh, so as to not be a heretic? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in fact, the, the great book, actually, I'm really glad that, that Shabir mentioned kind of heresy, because I completely agree. It is, you know, quite easy to try and describe the Trinity, and you invent three uh, amusing heresies before breakfast. And in fact, if you really want to have some fun with this after the evening, get onto your laptops and Google St. Patrick's Bad Analogies. A um, few of you know that one. So go. It's a really comic look at some of the bad heresies uh, throughout Christian history. And I promise I won't say, come on, Patrick, to uh, Shabir beer at any point for those of you who already know that uh, video. Um, but the book I really like on this actually is called The Cruelty of Heresy by, I forget the author's name, if you put it into Amazon. And what's interesting, he looks at some of those heresies, but in particular shows why they're important. Um, because if you misunderstand the Trinity, it's not just some vague theological conception you get wrong. Actually, you lose a lot of God in the process. For example, if Jesus does not belong to the identity of God, then actually we can't actually fundamentally know about God. You have a God who is very likely deism or the god of Gnosticism which has been an influence on the Quran who is distant and remote remember in Islam not even Muhammad had God speak to him directly when the Quran was revealed unlike the Old Testament prophets and the in, in the Bible you have this God who is earthy and engaged with reality a God who is imminent as well as a God who is transcendent and that gets lost in many other conceptions of God so to understand the Trinity I'd recommend take a look at that book and there's also because I'm a great believer in recommending resources if you really want to think through the Trinity as a Christian a soundbite isn't going to do it. Mike Reeves, uh, uh, Delighting in the Trinity, is a wonderful little book. That, uh, he's a wonderful church historian. He'll help you understand the Trinity, think about it, and get it right. It's worth reflecting and doing it properly rather than doing theology by tweet. 
Where we have begun, I want to emphasize again that uh, Muslims and Christians can work together to make our world a better place. Of course, differences in theology uh, should not prevent us from working together. Uh, but I've contended tonight that uh, if, if Christians uh, can um, come to uh, what the Bible actually says about Jesus, then that will bring Christians closer to Muslims, in that Christians would then affirm that despite whatever else you can say about Jesus, Jesus is actually not God. You might say that he's very great, you might say he's the son of God, not that Muslims will accept any of this, but to Muslims it will make a great deal of difference that you are still affirming that there is only one God, and there will be here no confusion when you say that, because if you say that Jesus is God, now we're hearing two, and if you try to explain it to us, it seems that the explanations are recondite. And I noticed that Andy, when he had the chance to explain the Trinity, he, he just pointed to books that explain the Trinity. Uh, it, perhaps he was afraid that if he explained the Trinity, he might fall into one of the heresies that he <laughs> talked about. And so, so this is a difficulty. Now, the difficulty doesn't only come when you try to explain it, but when you come to think about it. Now, of course, we, we cannot think wrong thoughts about God, and we cannot imagine somebody else to be God that is not God. The Old Testament uses the analogy of marriage uh, for our relationship with God and turning to a false God would be uh, uh, not only idolatrous but adulterous according to the Old Testament uh, thinking so think about your own marriage then uh, can you think of some other person as being your spouse and can you have some confusion as to who actually is your spouse no in the mind it has to be very clear so when Muslims say that there is only one God Allah it is very clear to Muslims whom we're referring to uh, but uh, when our Christian friends say that uh, Jesus is God and the Father is God and the Holy Holy Spirit is God. It, there seems to be some lack of clarity. Are these three separate gods? Are there three uh, individuals working together as a team? The, is the team stronger than any of the individuals by, by themselves and so on? So uh, thinking about it uh, is like walking on a tightrope. You either fall into one heresy or the other. Either you, you emphasize the distinctiveness in which you seem to have three gods or you minimize the distinctiveness in which you in which case you fall into Sabellianism or modalism in which you don't anymore have three persons. You have one God, yes, and you have the three modes of existence, but you no longer have the Trinity and you do not have actually three persons. And then you cannot explain why was Jesus on the earth worshiping the Father if they are not actually two. Uh, so there are great difficulties. Now, I want to pick up some of the pieces that uh, were discussed. In the Q&A, somebody asked about Mark 14 again, and this picks up on Andy's point. When Jesus was under trial, and he was being asked, are you the Christ, son of the, the blessed? And he says, I am. Well, he's not saying, I am God. He's saying, I am Christ and son of the blessed. Now, of course, Muslims will not accept that Jesus is literally the son of God. But if Christians accepted that and didn't go the further step and say, well, he's actually God, whose son he is, uh, well, well, then uh, Muslims and Christians would actually be closer together because Christians in that case would not be asserting that Jesus is God. They would only be asserting that Jesus is the Son of God. And then Jesus spoke about the Son of Man who will come in the clouds of heaven. Now, as Bruce Chilton has pointed out in Mark's Gospel, when Jesus speaks about the futuristic coming of the Son of Man, he is actually referring to someone else in the third person. He doesn't say, I will come on the clouds of heaven. He's speaking about the the son of man who will come, referring to this in the third person as someone else as the son of man. Who is this mysterious son of man and when he will come? That's a different question. But in Mark's gospel, as Bruce Chilton ably proves, there, there is no instance where Jesus, in speaking about the futuristic son of man, is actually referring to himself. It's always in the third person, obviously referring to someone else. Uh, so, in, in conclusion, I want to say that the points that we have discussed here tonight are very important. We ask, is Jesus a man, a, a myth, or is he God? And I've said that we agree that he's a man. We also agree that in the popular sense of the term myth, Jesus is not a myth. He actually existed in history. When it comes to the other meaning of myth, the academic meaning, I, in our discussion, a lot of things came up. For example, the change of the crucifixion date to represent Jesus as the Passover lamb, uh, which is mythical. The idea that Jesus dies for the sins of the world and so on. And then finally, I have laid good ground to show that there are clear statements in the New Testament indicating 
indicating that Jesus is not God, the clearest one being Mark chapter 13, verse number 32, which shows that he is not omniscient. And I would beg Andy to interpret the rest of the Bible in the light of the clear statements. That's the basic hermeneutics 101, and that uh, obscure statements should be interpreted in the light of the clear. Thank you very much.